Afternoon, and welcome back to our next session. Um, I want to ask you to in, in, engage in this next one, which is a fairly unique session. Um, a couple years ago, we asked Dr. Cotton to join us and address pieces of wellness, self-care, those types of things, which I think are really pertinent to our families with CHARGE and not only are individuals affected by CHARGE, but also their caregivers. Uh, so this entire community actually gave us great feedback last time about the merit of having Shawnee do this talk. Dr. Cotton is the director for the UC Center for Integrative Health, which is a fairly innovative center here that we feel very fortunate to have in our community. And it'll be a slightly different talk than what you're used to. Please engage, go along with this as, as she goes through the material. And thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Chu. Always a pleasure. Um, happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So I will start by uh, just saying that uh, I am a parent. I'm a parent of a 16, a 14, and 11-year-old. Uh, parenting never came with a manual. I wish it had, but it didn't. Uh, but my disclaimer is that I'm not a parent of a child with a chronic illness. So um, I can't speak to you uh, from that perspective. Uh, and I don't know what it is to either be parenting or be a healthcare professional of a child with a chronic illness. Um, but I, I work a lot in the space of integrated medicine, self-care and wellness. So my hope is some of the things that um, I share today may be helpful in your own journey, whether you're a parent, uh, whether you're a healthcare provider, whether you're part of the IT team putting on this fabulous uh, presentation today. So the goals today are to paint a little bit about parental stress and resilience when coping with a chronic illness. I'd like to talk about the physiology of stress. We talk a lot about stress, but what does it do? What, how does it work physiologically? And why is self-care so important? And you know, self-care was important, Dr. Chu, yeah, two years ago when I came, but now we have a global pandemic on top of all of us. We have political unrest and social unrest, like anything we've seen. So uh, whichever piece is important for you and your self-care today, I hope you take something home. Um, Mind-body techniques. I'm going to teach some, I hope, some really practical techniques today. And we're actually going to practice some of these today. So as Dr. Chu said, I invite you to um, have some fun, participate, chat in questions. Uh, my hope is this is going to be a little bit more interactive uh, rather than just talking to. So um, very briefly, we're not going to spend a lot of time here. And you all know this, but I'd like to show you some of the data uh, about coping with uh, the stress of chronic illness as a parent. Uh, what we know, again, from decades of science is that caregivers of children with chronic illness report significantly greater parental stress than caregivers of healthy children, which is my sort of first disclaimer coming in today. Um, in a large, large study, this was a study of, uh, of over 50,000 parents of children with chronic illness, um, higher severity of the condition was associated with even higher levels of parenting stress. And not surprisingly, uh, parents that had more stress had worse mental health. Again, this is not something um, that I'm sharing with you that's new, but just to kind of paint the landscape uh, a little bit. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder. We often think of PTSD in uh, kind of our veterans and people that are in times of war. It's very common also when it comes to chronic il illnesses. And certainly parents, and I say parents, guardians, caregivers, of children with chronic illnesses report significant levels of PTSD, 19.6 for mothers, 11.6 for fathers, as compared to a much lower group when we're looking at uh, parents that don't have children with chronic illness. And again, anxiety and depression are much higher. Mothers scored significantly higher both in anxiety and depression, fathers higher in depression. And again, being mindful that there's mothers, fathers, grandparents, lots of different caregivers. Um, so I'll stop there with painting that picture, but really what I'm trying to highlight here is that the stress is real, it's documented, and it's within this context that we think about self-care. Um, the other layer to add is, does this look familiar to anybody? Um, you look at the multitasking, you know, you got a phone, you got the bagel, you're drinking your coffee, we're super on, we're super connected all the time. And so you layer on just the time of connectivity in the addition to the global pandemic, um, and you think about the level of stress that we're under. You think about stress. One thing sometimes we don't think about stress, some people might say, oh yeah, I'm stressed, but I can manage it, is from a physiologic standpoint, the brain doesn't like high levels of stress. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what happens when we're stressed. 
But brain under stress, like chronic stress, when your stress hormone, your cortisol hormone is really, really high, our brain doesn't like that. There are things that structurally change within our brain uh, that are not good for us. Our hippocampus atrophies or shrinks. And one of the things that your hippocampus does is it's short-term memory. You can't find your phone, you can't find your glasses, uh, you forget that you drove somewhere. Our prefrontal cortex also shrinks under high levels of stress. That's your executive functioning, your ability to make decisions. So it's not just, oh, I'm stressed, I'm having a bad day, but it actually has some real consequences. The good news is I'm gonna show you some things today that actually can help with that and can help offset that. So that's just my preview of saying it's within the context of that parenting, uh, working within the current situation, we're working within our global pandemic that I wanna think about putting on your own oxygen mask. You know, what do you do every day for yourself? Not for your child, not for your spouse, not for your associates, your employees, or your students, but what do you do every day for your own self-care? And it's gonna be different, but what, how do you put that oxygen mask on first so you can be supportive for the people around you that need you? Um, the other thing as we're talking about oxygen mask is resilience. So people hear this word a lot, but how do you become resilient? How do you actually become resilient under significant stress? The American Psychological Association, this is the definition that they use, which is fine, but I'm going to go a little bit further. They talk about resilience as the process of adapting well, even in the face of adversity trauma or a significant threat. And so again, you see those families with two children and the one child is under stress and really doesn't do well and the other one really does well. Well, you say, well, that's the resilient child. But I actually like this definition better. So our colleagues Epstein and Krasner talk about the resilience is the ability of an individual to respond to stress in a healthy, adaptive way. And that resilient individuals not only bounce back, but they actually grow stronger in the process. And the reason I put the picture of the tree here, if you know anything about trees, what happens is when trees bend in the wind and they get pushed, they actually grow stronger when they come back up. They actually root into the ground more. And then the last piece I'll put about resilience, Stephen Southwick is a psychiatrist who's written a wonderful book about uh, kind of resilience. Um, he studied lots and lots of different people under different stress. And his bottom line was, anybody can learn to be resilient. We all have different stressors in our lives. Mine is not the same. We are not in the same boat. We are in the same storm right now, but not the same boat, but that anyone can actually learn these tools. So let's talk a little bit about physiology of stress, importance of self-care. This is my 11-year-old Noah. This was at Hilton Head uh, this summer. And actually, my favorite part of this picture, which I didn't realize until this morning, is if you can see his shirt, it says, Quiet Storm. And so I, I have pictures of him each year kind of in his meditation pose. But, you know, we've all got the quiet storm inside, and we're trying to manage as we go forward. Um, so some of you have done this with me two years ago. I know Anne said that she remembered it last year. She was excited to do it again this year. So this is going to be first of two um, kind of experientials we're going to do. If you don't want to do it, it's fine. I can't see you anyway, so I won't know if you're doing it. Go to the bathroom. That's fine and come back. But I might invite you, as Dr. Chu said, to just try this because this will lay the foundation for what we're talking about today. So I'm going to invite you, whatever space that you're in, um, to kind of get comfortable. Maybe put your feet flat on the floor, feel the support of the chair or the, or the, um, the wall, or if you're laying down right now, but just kind of put yourself in a place that feels comfortable. Arms and legs in a place that feels just good for you. Closing your eyes if you're in a place that you can do that. If you're driving, please don't do so. But closing your eyes to just minimize the distractions around you. And this will only be a few minutes. I'll tell you when to come back. But I'd like you to imagine yourself in a place that's very familiar. I'd like you to imagine right now as if you are in your kitchen. Very familiar place. Really try and imagine yourself in your kitchen right now. Look around. What, what appliances do you see? Who's in the, who's in the kitchen with you? What are the smells in the kitchen? What are the aromas? Is there something delicious cooking on the oven, in the oven? What are the sounds in your kitchen? Music playing, humming of the refrigerator. Just really try and focus and imagine as if you are in your kitchen right now. And now in your kitchen, you look down on the counter, and on the countertop, there's a nice cutting board. And on the cutting board, you see a beautiful yellow ripe 
plump, juicy looking lemon, bright, bright yellow. And you imagine picking it up in your hand and you feel the texture of the plump, juicy skin, bright yellow. And you set the lemon down and you imagine picking up a nice knife that's next to the cutting board. And you go ahead and just imagine slicing that lemon just in half. And as you slice it in half, you immediately smell that pungent lemony scent. And you see the, the juicy beads of lemon juice rolling down onto the counter. And then imagine cutting a nice wedge. And again, the beautiful lemony scent and the, the juicy beads. And then setting the knife down and imagine picking up that lemon wedge and bringing it up to your nose. Just again, smelling and maybe noticing the anticipation as it's close to your mouth. And then imagining opening up your mouth and taking a nice big bite. And then hold on to that sensation for just a moment. Set the lemon wedge down, say goodbye to your kitchen. You'll see it soon. And then slowly start to come back into whatever space you're in, maybe wiggling fingers, toes, gently allowing eyes to open. And then I can't see you, but I'm gonna invite you to at least answer this question. Raise your hand. Uh, were you able to, how many people were able to actually imagine their kitchen? Could you imagine your kitchen? Most people can. Dr. Chu shaking his head. Most people can get there. Could you imagine the lemon? So raise your hand or just answer for yourself if you could imagine the lemon. Great. All right, so now I'm going to ask you, and if we were in person, I'd have you shout this out to me, but we're not. So did anybody notice anything when they bit into the lemon, when they took a bite? Anybody salivate? Anyone get that like puckering, like, ooh, here comes the lemon? Usually about 50 to 75% will raise their hand. And it's okay, if you didn't have it, you don't like lemons, you don't like my voice, you're having a bad day, you need a cup of coffee, it's fine. But many, many people, Dr. Chu, will salivate or they'll have kind of a response. And the question is, why would I bring this here today? Why would we sit here and do this lemon imagery? And the question is actually, why do people have the response? Why do people salivate? Why do you have that? Because the news flash here is there's no lemon, right? There's no lemon here. What you were able to do, many of you, was to produce a physiologic response using just your mind. Foundation of mind-body medicine, nothing fancy, right? It's just that you have a memory. Your brain has a memory of a lemon and it knows that pH balance is different than what it's usually and it gets ready for the lemon by salivating and getting that kind of sensation ready. So again, it's a, you know when somebody says, what'd you learn today? How was the conference? Well, this person did this lemon thing. It's not about the lemon. What it is really about is the foundation of mind-body medicine. And how do we utilize things like that mind-body connection, the natural hardwired connection between our brain and our body to actually improve wellness? And so our National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, this is our National Institutes of Health that fund most of our kind of health research in the country. They talk about mind-body medicine. This is the part of our kind of scientific branch, you know, lives in Bethesda, Maryland, that they study things like, scientists study things like herbs, fish oil, ginkgo, all those kind of products. Mind-body medicine fits within this space. Meditation, how do we utilize yoga? How do we think about guided imagery, all for kind of wellness? The other areas in this space, again, the space of integrative health, manipulative and body-based practices. Some people might utilize massage, chiropractic work. And then there's other complementary integrative medicine practices. There's energy therapies. There's whole medical systems like traditional Chinese medicine. I just show you this to show you where sort of mind-body medicine fits within kind of the medical field. And to tell you that most major medical centers around our country, including UC and Children's, now are utilizing many of these therapies, evidence-based to really improve uh, wellness. So mind-body techniques, and we're going to talk a little bit about these today. Things like meditation, uh, the use of guided imagery, which is what the lemon imagery was, biofeedback, which is used a lot in the treatment of children with headache, maybe inflammatory bowel syndrome, autogenic training. It's sort of a self-hypnosis utilized a lot in Germany where you might repeat to yourself, my arms are heavy and warm. I am at peace. Breathing techniques. Breathing techniques are the foundation of many of these mind-body techniques. Because at the end of the day, what we're looking to do is really kind of induce what's called the relaxation response. 
the importance of exercise, movement meditations like yoga, tai chi, often done in the context of group support. And so again, I invite you as we continue here, please feel free to chat in any questions that you have and I'm happy to stop at any time. Uh, why do we talk about mind-body therapies when it comes to wellness and self-care? Loads of evidence, right? Decades and decades of science have shown that these things are helpful, particularly when it relates to stress and anxiety, sleep issues, maybe headaches or pain used a lot in some of the kind of disease and treatment related symptoms of cancer, cardiovascular disease, many, many practices. And so yes, stress, but there's many other places within our lives that we can think about using these. Stress response. Uh, again, I'm a psychologist by training, so I apologize to those physicians or nurses that might be listening or physiologists that could explain this better. But let's think for a moment about the fight or flight response, right? Oxygen mask on, how do we take care of ourselves? What happens in your body when the fight or flight response kicks in? And everybody knows what it feels like, right? Something happens, the car's coming, you cross the street or your kid's there, and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, what happens? Well, what happens is your brain perceives a threat, right? And if your brain perceives a threat, it could be a financial threat, an emotional threat, a physical threat, a cognitive threat. If your brain says, this is a threat, there's an amazing cascade that goes on within your body, a physiologic stress response called the fight or flight response, right? Sends a signal to your hypothalamus. Your hypothalamus sends a signal then and a cascade of hormones are released and a cascade of processes throughout your body. Your heart rate's going up, your blood's pumping, you're ready to fight whatever it is, your respiration's going up. And so I would invite you to you know, think, is this a good or a bad thing? Right, and so it depends, right? It depends. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing, it's an amazing thing in an acute stress response. It's what's gonna have you slam on the brakes or it's gonna be what's gonna have you, you know, get out of harm's way. But the question is, and I'd ask you this and think about this for yourself, how many of you, including myself, Dr. Chu and others, deal with one stress at a time? How many of you wait until the stress at work is resolved or the stress at home or a fight with a family member or an issue with a child and then uh, let me deal with this first and then deal with the next one, right? So this is actually the, this is the chronic stress I talked about earlier. Acute response, amazing. And the amazing thing about this system is it's designed to shut off when the threat goes away. But in today's day and age, and particularly sitting here today, given what the world is going through and what you already go through on a daily basis, I would say that the stress is even higher. So this is what we're trying to think about, is how do we uh, help the chronic stress level? What do we know about chronic stress? We've already talked about it a little bit. It impairs our memory, our learning, our immune system, and it really impacts our lives. So what do we do, right? How do we impact our lives in a positive way? I would say one of my mentors, Dr. Boat, always said to me, Sean, you've got to remind people, not all stress is bad. Right? Stress gets you to get up, make your slides, get organized, do what you need to do for your family. So it's not all bad. Um, but if there's one slide at least to think about today, I'd like you to think about this one. The importance is returning to baseline. So on the left hand side, you see your stress hormone. Everyone's heard about the cortisol. Stress hormone goes up. So here's what should happen. Right, Stressor happens, your fight or flight kicks in, and it slows down, and you're back. Right, Fabulous. You had a response. You're fine. But what happens if you haven't quite resolved the first one and a text comes through and something's broken at home and you can't figure it out and you don't, you don't have the finances to pay for it. And then, oh my goodness, then an email rolls in or some neighbor says something or something. And all of a sudden you'll see that this level hasn't gone back down. It'd be as if I said to you, uh, go and you know, run up 10 flights of stairs and you're pretty in shape so you can do it. And then I say to you, now hold two 20 pound weights in both of your hands and go right up that, that same flight of 10 stairs. You're not as able to do it, right? You're not able to come back to baseline. You're not able to be as resilient. So the question for each of us, and the answer will be different, is how do we get back here? What helps you in your daily life? What helps me? What helps all of us return to baseline? And by baseline, I mean that physiologic system. How do you get your system to settle back down so that you can live a productive life, you can sleep well, you can take care of who you need to take care of, and frankly, have a good quality of life. The answer is gonna be different for everyone. So at the UC Center for Integrative Health and Wellness, and certainly within uh, Dr. Chu's and others program, and we know the foundations of wellness. The foundations for wellness are not rocket science. They are how you choose to eat every day and your access to food, how you move every day, how you manage your stress, how you connect with the world around you, spiritually or in nature or whatever that is, 
These are the foundations of wellness and they're based in hard science. We're gonna focus a little bit more on the managing stress and kind of mind body techniques, but I wanna be very clear that the, the picture of wellness for me is not just about meditation. It is a broad based picture. Um, and I just invite you to think for yourself, what are you currently doing? What's one thing within this space that you could change? You know, what's maybe something that you ha can get back to that you haven't done for a while? So I like this picture uh, because uh, I do a lot of mindfulness and meditation training and teaching. And people say, well, Sean, I don't have 20 minutes to go sit. And I'm thinking, I don't either. But you can drop in in any moment. You can take a 60 second break and take three big belly breaths just to settle your system down. So I like the picture because it's real life and we can drop into this in many places in our lives. Um, again, uh, if we were in person, I would invite you to ask questions. So please, if you have questions, if you have comments, uh, please let us know. So mind-body techniques, what is it? Um, mind-body techniques use that natural connection. I tried to, again, we do this with medical students on day one, that lemon imagery I did with you, um, to say to them, it's a natural connection. It's not new. It's been around for thousands of years always, but it's just capitalizing on that connection. It's believing it and saying, okay, let me try and see what I can do to capitalize on that for my own health and for my family's health. And it is actually now, it has surpassed natural products, which are kind of supplements. Those used to be the number one sort of integrative therapy used in the United States. Mind-body practices have clearly surpassed that now. And at the basis of mind-body therapies, which we're gonna practice and try some now, is really um, in, is, is the opposite of the fight or flight response. So we've talked about the fight or flight response. Um, Herb Benson was the first to coin what's called the relaxation response. So it's sort of the opposite to that early uh, mid seventies. And what we used to think was that kind of our autonomic nervous system just kind of did what it did and we just had to let it do what it did. The answer to that is no. So again, decades of science have shown us that you can actually regulate your physiologic system and you can yourself induce the relaxation response with practice. And these are things like breathing exercises, guided imagery, progressive muscle relaxation, all of which we'll kind of walk through together. Hmm. I seem thank you to Jay and others to get me back. So we're gonna cruise through about 20 slides, or I guess I will cruise through. So while I'm doing this, go and actually just pay attention to your breath for a moment. Um, go ahead and just settle into your breath and just kind of notice where your breathing is. Close your eyes if that's easy. Is your breathing shallow? Is it full? And again, there's no right or wrong answer. Just kind of notice where your breath is right now. And you might even notice what thoughts are you having? What emotions are here this morning, this afternoon? Just kind of take notice of where you are right now. And then maybe turning your attention back to sort of your breath. And just really noticing, noticing the feelings of your inhalations and of your exhalations. Notice where the breath goes in the body. And you might even, uh, might invite you to put your hand on your belly if you're comfortable. And see if on your next breath, see if you can actually move your belly out, almost like it's a balloon filling with air. Again, no forcing, but just see if on your next inhalation, with your hand on your belly, see if you can actually push your belly out as if a balloon were filling up. And then on the exhalation, letting that balloon deflate. Again, see if you can push the belly out on the inhalation and then on the exhalation, let it fall back. So again, just letting your breath drop down into your belly for what's called belly breathing, diaphragmatic breathing. And see if you can just allow a little bit more breath into your belly as you breathe. We tend to breathe with our chest about 20% of capacity. See if you can really allow a little bit more expansion. And 
your belly might not only go out, but you might see your, your rib cages. Your rib cage might feel a little bit more full as you allow the breath to really fill. Fill sort of those cavities. Great, and then just softly allowing kind of your natural breathing to come back. Again, not forcing sort of a deep belly breath at all, but just allowing. And if you've closed your eyes, coming back in. I was able to reset my own as the slides were dancing around. So deep breathing again is one very simple deep breathing, people, belly breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, yogic breathing, tripartite breathing. It's nothing swanky. It's literally just when we talk about returning to baseline, your breath is the number one thing that you have and you have it all day long, every day. You can't sleep. You're gonna yell at someone. If you can kick in that kind of belly breathing, even just three times, no one even knows you're doing it. That is one very simple tool to utilize. And the other one that I like to talk about is inhale, double exhale, because it's very easy to learn. What we know is if we exhale longer, it engages what's called our parasympathetic nervous system. That's the side, as many of you know, is responsible for rest, uh, digestion, relaxation. That's the part that you want to engage when you're trying to go to sleep. The sympathetic nervous system is that fight or flight, like putting on the gas pedal. So what we know about breath is if you actually exhale longer than you inhale, it engages this side. It engages this rest and relaxation response. And this is a very easy way. If you are stressed, if you're in a moment and you can inhale, double exhale, for example, inhale, I'll practice with you just for a moment, but you can count for yourself. You can inhale for two, exhale for four. You could inhale for three, exhale for six, but let's just practice just for 30 seconds together. So you might inhale for two and exhale two, three, four. Inhale, two, exhale, two, three, four. Inhale for two, exhale, two, three, four. And again, the goal here, you know, go ahead and do it on your own. Pick whatever works for you. The goal is you're gonna inhale on a count of one and you're gonna do whatever, you're gonna double your exhale. It tells your brain um, that you should no longer be in the emergency breath. It literally sends a signal to your brain, it's okay to slow down. And it slows down your physiology, slows down your psychology, and hopefully helps you to come into the present moment. Mm -hmm. Guided imagery. So we did a little bit, this is another mind-body practice. Many of you might use this, but in a guided imagery, it's kind of like um, directed daydreaming. So you might imagine yourself in a beautiful, relaxed place. Um, you might uh, do uh, what's called end state imagery, where you might imagine. So end state imagery is done actually, by the way, by our NFL players all the time, by our athletes. You ever seen a diver go out on the edge of the you know, platform, or whatever it's called, the diving board, and you can see them going through the entire thing because what they're doing is they're using imagery to imagine as if they've had an amazing dive, right? You could think about maybe some of your children, maybe yourself going into a difficult procedure. And how do you imagine being in a safe place, go to the special place, imagine it being done. So there's a lot of use for, uh, for imagery. There's a wonderful app I'll show you at the end called Insight Timer. I think it's the best app out there right now that has a lot of wonderful imagery practices. Again, the goal is utilizing the power of your mind to put yourself in a relaxed state, maybe in a state of feeling confident before you walk into something difficult. But again, just another practice. Um, some of you may know about progressive muscle relaxation. This is a very easy one. It's very easy to, I've, to teach to children. I've used it myself. You can just Google it. Uh, it's called PMR. And what you do is the goal is to counter, you know, sometimes we're actually so stressed and tight, we don't even know we are. And so you basically do a systematic um, breathing in and tightening. You might start down at your feet, for example, and kind of tighten your feet to a, like to the count of three and then you release your feet and you release the breath. And then you move that up and you might tighten your, for example, your legs. And you might ask you to tight, tight, tight to a breath. And then you exhale. And so you just sequentially tighten and release your body, either from your head down to your toes, your toes all the way up. And sometimes we don't even realize we're holding the tension. Again, I encourage you, if you'd like to try it, there's lots of scripts on Google. Um, Insight Timer does a really wonderful job as well. Just another way to help release and relax tension. 
Um, so talk a bit about mindfulness. Um, people talk all about mindfulness. This, and we're going to do a, a brief practice together. This is John Kabat-Zinn. So John Kabat-Zinn is kind of the guru of mindfulness in the West. He brought this to UMass Medical Center about 30 years ago. There were hosts of patients with mostly with chronic pain that weren't getting better. And, and some of his physician colleagues sent them and said, John, what do you, I don't know what you're doing, but go see if you can do something with them. So John was doing something called mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, uh, and this is how he defines it. Mindfulness, it's not swanky. It's not woo-woo. It's nothing unattainable. It's a skill that we can all learn. And it's really an awareness. In fact, one of my surgery colleagues said to me, oh, Sean, that's what mindfulness is. That's what I do in surgery. It's an awareness that emerges through your paying attention in a very particular way on purpose. And you're in the present moment. You're not in the past. You're not in the future. And it's very natural. But, you know, we spend a lot of our times in the past and the future. We spend a lot of time worrying, a lot of time, you know, worrying about stuff that happened. But in the present moment and non-judgmentally, which is the piece that gets left out of the Western translation, which is and to the unfolding of experience moment to moment. That's the official definition. What I'll tell you it really means is that we live our lives on automatic pilot. How many times have you driven somewhere and thought, how did I get there? Like, where did I put my phone? And somehow it's on the second floor in somebody's room. Uh, because we're not in the present. Much of the time, our minds aren't here. Uh, what I love about mindfulness, it's a skill. It can be taught. It's just like going to the gym and exercising. You're exercising your physical body. These mindfulness practices are things that you can learn. Uh, you can learn them with practice, and we'll talk a little about what you can do. Uh, and the goal is really uh, improve well-being, less anxiety, less stress, better sleep, better focus. Uh, it's actually a really, really wonderful um, skill to learn and the benefits from, from a self-care standpoint are significant. Uh, mindfulness, people always think mindfulness is meditation. It's not. Mindfulness can be in everything. So for example, think about, John kabat teaches about shower. Think about your last shower. Hopefully it was today or yesterday and not several days ago. Bath. Think about like a shower. And when you're in the shower, how many times were you actually in the shower? Smelling the soap, maybe feeling the water, listening to the sound of the water. I mean, my guess is when you're in the shower or brushing your teeth, that's a really easy, accessible one. Um, you're think, you're brushing your teeth this morning. You're thinking about your day. What are you going to wear? What am I feed the kids for breakfast? You're not actually experiencing the teeth brushing. So you can have a mindful walk, a mindful shower, a mindful anything, and you can cultivate mindfulness with things like mindfulness meditation, but actually you can bring mindfulness into many, many places uh, within your life. What's meditation? People, again, often ask, what's the difference? So in a meditation, you're comfortable, you're going to quiet your mind, you're going to focus in the now. Um, it's really a, an attention focus, and you may actually find that your brain kind of shifts into a different state of consciousness, and it's really staying open to kind of what is um, and, and being kind of open. So there's kind of three types of meditation. Uh, I just want to, you know, people talk about there's concentrated meditation. Uh, the VA uses a lot of mantra meditation, and this might work for you, uh, where you focus on a word, a word that's important to you. Uh, many people think about prayer as kind of a concentrated meditation because you're sort of repeating things over. Um, Activity-oriented meditation, things like yoga and tai chi. So you're moving, but within the moving, you're bringing yourself into the present moment. You're not thinking about your emails or what's going on, you're actually trying to focus in the present moment. And then there's the mindfulness types, and that's actually this, we're gonna do one here uh, in a few minutes together, but a mindfulness meditation where you're just coming back to the present moment. You're not coming back to a word, you're not coming back to your breath, you're just coming back to your present moment experience. So in a mindfulness meditation, and we're gonna do one in a moment here, I'm gonna keep asking you to come back, come back to what is. And you're gonna notice, and I'm gonna invite you to notice what is. If you're stressed this afternoon, if you're tired, if you're annoyed, if you just, you, you got to get up, you've been sitting too long, that's fine. There's no right or wrong with mindfulness meditation. It really is about present moment experience and awareness. And one of the goals is when we're able to really notice what's happening right now, if you're really actually here in this moment listening right now, you can't be stressed about what's coming next, or you can't be worried about what happened this morning or an argument because you're actually here right now. So the goal is to engage in present moment awareness, really to be able to live my more fully in the moment. Do we have time for an exercise? Sure. So let's try it. All right, so I'm gonna invite you to um, get comfortable wherever you are. I'm gonna invite you to, again, similarly, put your legs in a arms in a place that feel just right for you. 
What's most important with any type of mindfulness practice is that you're comfortable. So take your shoes off if you need to, take your glasses off. So you wanna be in a place where your head, neck, and spine are aligned and comfortable. Closing your eyes if that's comfortable, and if not, just a soft gaze downward to minimize distractions. Start by just noticing the top of your head. Notice how the weight of the head drops into the shoulders. The weight of the shoulders drops into the hips, the hips into the knees, the knees into the feet, and grounding you down into the earth. And we're going to start by just noticing what is here for you right now. Notice thoughts. Notice how does your physical body feel in this space right now? You notice emotions that you're having. There's no right, there's no wrong. We're not trying to change anything. We're just noticing, almost taking an inventory of where you are right now. You might even say to yourself, whatever I'm feeling, it's already here. So let me just experience it. And when your mind wanders, which it will because we're all human, just gently and with no judgment, bring yourself back to your present moment experience. What am I feeling right now? And now see if you can move all of your awareness and your attention onto your breath for just a moment. Noticing the feelings of the inhalations and of the exhalations. You're not trying to change or force your breath in any way. You're really just taking notice of the breath and how it feels right now. You might notice the cool air moving in and out of your nostrils or maybe your belly moving up and down. Use your breath to anchor yourself in this present moment. And if thoughts come, or if you hear noises, let them come and let them go. Always coming back to your inhalation and to your exhalation. And now in this final moment, see if you can become aware of your entire being in this moment. Maybe utilizing the breath as a guide, starting down at your toes, watching the breath move up your legs and into your hips and your torso and your chest and your neck and out the top of your head. Really seeing if you can sense your entire being in this moment. Again, when your mind wanders or you hear noises, just come back to the present moment, to your breath. And then in this pause, thanking yourself for the opportunity to take just a few moments, knowing that you can come back anytime throughout your day or the evening. 
very slowly and gently, starting to guide your awareness and your attention back, maybe wiggling fingers or toes, maybe a neck roll if that feels good. And at your own pace, allowing your eyes to gently open. Coming back in. Just take note of how you feel. There's no right, there's no wrong. You might feel relaxed or tired. You might feel annoyed. You might feel energized. Again, with the mindfulness practice, there's no right or wrong answer. So we'll end a little bit on kind of the benefits. Why would we bring this today? Why is it important? We know self-care is important. We know wellness is important. What I wanted to do today was bring you some some actual tools and show you the why. Like these are all the physiologic benefits of meditation and mindfulness. Decreased heart rate, calm breathing, reduced cortisol, improved immune functioning, helps with sleep, chronic pain. I mean, who doesn't want whatever medication or something that does this? And this is something that's inside of you, you can access all the time. We look at psychologically, people that do mindfulness and meditation practices Increase self-awareness, um, improved emotional well-being, improved mood, and really significant reductions in things like anxiety, stress, uh, PTSD, eating disorders, substance use. Now, I will tell you the benefits that we see here aren't after a five-week or five-minute, not a five-week, a five-minute, you know, app on like a United Airlines flight. Um, you really have to do these. Most of these studies have been done on eight weeks and really trying to do something every day. And so we'll talk in a minute about kind of how might you get started and neurologically, why does this work? Why would mindfulness and meditation be associated with all these benefits? What we know is that, or what we certainly know about the brain is the neuroplasticity, the ability of the brain to kind of shape and kind of develop new neural connections. And what we know is that after eight weeks of kind of a mindfulness meditation practice, neural pathways, so pathways in your brain are actually strengthened. And they're areas that are related to things that you would think would be improved after meditation, things like emotion regulation, uh, things like attention and control. So areas of the brain light up eight weeks later when people practice this. So there's good science to support why these things might be good for your health. So how do you get started? Some of you may already have a mindfulness and meditation practice. Um, these are my boys down on the right-hand side. They're a lot bigger now. But again, I like to show this because I can't go to Nepal or Tibet and sit for a month either. Like we have to figure out how to do this in our real life, right? How do we drop into that space? So um, I'd encourage you, if you're going to try this, or even if you already have a practice, pick a time when you won't be interrupted. If you need, put a sign on the door. There's a dean I know that has a sign that says, come back in five minutes, I'm breathing. For me, I do it when I wake up. I finally have a practice. It took me a while. I've been doing it for about two years. Every morning, I pour my coffee and I sit in front of my fireplace. I'm up to 10 minutes now. But pick a time and everyone's asleep when you won't be interrupted. Be consistent. It's like exercise. Uh, the more you do it, the more consistent you are. That's much more important. If you miss a day, it's fine. Come back and do it the next day. Start with one to five minutes a day. I mean, honestly, we tell people to start with 60 seconds. So if you can just 60 seconds a day, pick a time and it could be when you're, you know, whatever, maybe right when you wake up. 60 seconds just to practice kind of some deep breathing and a breathing meditation. And then eventually maybe you'll build up. But just to 60 seconds a day is a great start. Be comfortable, as we've talked about. Um, track your time if you want. Um, you know, there, our phones can be used for some good kind of goal setting. And give it time. So, so many people say to me, I can't meditate, Sean. I can't sit still. Well, you know what? Lots of people can't sit still. And I promise you that you actually can learn. You just have to find the one that's right for you. It might be a walking meditation. It might be yoga. It might just be a teeth brushing kind of informal practice. Again, regular practice is better than perfect. There's no perfect mindfulness practice. And try another type. If you hate sitting still and watching your breath, that's okay. Do a walking meditation. Many people, their runs are their meditation. Um, and then I'll end by saying, be gentle with yourself. You know, we're probably our worst critics. We're harsh on ourselves. We live in a stressful time. <laughs> so as you're trying something for your wellness, you know, what you don't want to do is say, oh, I can't do this. I can't get this wellness thing right. Be gentle. Give it a try. No judgment. Um, I do want to end with some um, resources here. So there's a couple apps, Calm, Headspace, and Insight Timer. I recommend all of them. I particularly really like Insight Timer because you can set mint, like I only have one minute, I have five minutes, I have 10, and you can set what it's for. Is it for sleep? Is it for anger? Is it for anxiety? And it kind of helps you tailor it. Um, and then these are both really good books. Again, they don't take the place of real care if you really need good mental health care. 
Um, there's lots of people that do this work, but the Mindful Way Workbook is a really good eight week program. And I just finished John Kabat Zinn's book, Wherever You Go, you, There You Are. It's a super approachable, really easy read with little snippets about mindfulness. So I think it's wonderful. Um, I will leave it there. I, I don't know where I am on time, but I'm happy to open it up for any comments or questions that people have. But thank you. So thanks so much, Sean. Sure. Um, one of the things that makes me a little curious is, so your regimen is now when you wake up in the morning and you set aside a little time for this. Mm-hmm. You know, in my naive thinking about it, I was just thought that this was a tool that you pulled up in the middle of the day when you hit a really stressful point and try to re- return to baseline again mm-hmm. kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But how is, how beneficial have you found it? And is that the same data that you showed? So if you do something at the start of your day, will there be lasting benefits as you go through? So it's a good question. So I'll unpack a little bit. So the the goal with these practices, the more you practice mindfulness, whether it be with a seated meditation like I do in the morning, or maybe you're going to practice it with your teeth brushing, the more you practice it, practice being able to come to baseline, practice noticing the more you can access it when you really need it. So the more you start to notice before I yell at my kid, all right, my heart rate is going up and I am about to, the more you can actually access the tools to downregulate your nervous system and be able to make a different decision and to be able to be more responsive, less reactive. So the goal is, is actually to practice it when you're in a good place, practice it when you're rested, practice it when there's no pressure, and then you'll be able to access it much more readily when you need it in the middle of the day. That makes a lot of sense. You know, I love, so people have been engaged and I love the pragmatism, but also just a little tongue in cheek stuff. So somebody had commented that these days with wearing masks, doing prolonged exhale only leads to foggy glasses. Well, that's true. (laughs) Yeah, I think there's a business to be made if we can figure out the foggy glasses. No, I would agree with that. I agree. About any... Any of the specific points out here that you found from the people that you've worked with that are particularly, what are the really beneficial ones that everybody comes back and says, oh, you know what? I've been able to implement that. The different practices. Uh Um, A lot of people like inhale, double exhale because it's accessible. They can remember it. So most people Uh hopefully will leave this and go, oh, yeah, she taught me inhale, double exhale. So that's one that people remember a lot. Um, people really like to know that they don't have to sit and do this for 30 minutes a day to get the benefit. People like to know that they can chunk it and that they can do a 60 second every day. And that if you do that 60 seconds, that's a fabulous start. And you're going to start to see benefits just from 60 seconds a day. So people like to know that, that they don't have to all of a sudden find, because who can find another 30 minutes in their day to go and sit and meditate. So people like inhale, double exhale, People like being able to have small snippets that they can do. And there's also a little difference between what's called informal practice and formal practice. So the mindfulness meditation that we did, that's more of a formal practice. That's kind of a seated practice. But the informal practice is like the teeth brushing, you know, habit chunking, where you put a mindful experience into something that you do all day long. So people like to have both an option of teeth brushing as an informal practice and a seated meditation as a formal, because there's some days when they're going to resonate more with one versus the other. They all get you to the same place. The more we increase our capacity for present moment awareness through some of these practices, the more we can access them in real time when we really need them. And then the last question I got for you is, I saw pictures of your kids. <laughs> so how, how was it to try and get your kids engaged in these practices? Oh, my kids hate these practices. <laughs> no, my kids will sit there. As I said earlier, they're 16, 14, and 11. I know, Mom. I'm just supposed to take a deep breath. I know, Mom. <laughs> so I, for my own personal life, have found them more, much more personally effective for me as mm-hmm. a parent uh, and as a partner and within my own kind of workspace. My kids have not engaged terribly. They just don't. Mm-hmm. As all kids, they're finding their own path. They know it. They know what it is. I invite them, and I think it's because what I do a lot, they don't want to touch it. But Noah actually has one, my 11-year-old. I don't know if it's a Fitbit, and it's the one where when you breathe, the flower kind of gets bigger, and then as he exhales, the flower gets small. He likes Mm -hmm. that one, you know, breathe. But again, because it's what mom talks about, they're not terribly excited to learn how to do (laughs) mindfulness meditation. All right. (laughs) Some things are universal. Yes. (laughs) All right. Well, Sean, thank you so much. And I encourage you guys, uh, the website also has some good links. Uh, Use some of those resource books. And 
some of those apps are also some of the very pragmatic tools that you just carry with you wherever you go. So really useful. So thanks, you guys. Stay tuned. More to come. And we'll close out this session now. <laughs>